You're watching the Recharge Your Life online video series, and I am so glad you found us and will be joining us this week. I'm your host, Phaedra Antioco, and I help people break free from emotional and physical pain. And oftentimes there are these hidden traumas that we develop that can get stored and stuck in our bodies, causing all sorts of pain. And that's what we are going to be addressing here today on the Recharge Your Life series, how to break free from the hidden traumas of the five Ds. What are they? Disease, divorce, death, debt, and disappointments. You know, those things that maybe didn't work out for you. We're gonna be sharing about that today. And first, we have Dr. Margaret Paul, and she's going to be sharing the two secrets to amazing health and emotional freedom. But first, let me share about Dr. Margaret Paul with you. She is a best-selling author and creator of the powerful Inner Bonding Self-Healing Process and the related SelfQuest Self-Healing Online Program. Dr. Margaret holds a PhD in psychology and is a relationship expert, consultant, and speaker, as well as an artist. She has successfully worked with thousands of people and taught classes and seminars for over 50 years. And she's appeared on numerous radio and television shows, including Oprah, and her book titles include, Do I Have to Give Up Me to Be Loved by You? Do I Have to Give Up Me to Be Loved by God and by My Kids? Healing Your Aloneness and Inner Bonding and her recently published Diet for Divine Connection and the Inner Bonding Workbook. So please stay tuned. You won't want to miss this interview. It's amazing where Dr. Margaret takes you on a journey inside and helps you figure out what you need and how to make those changes for a successful recharged life. Dr. Margaret, thank you so much for being here today. I know in my challenging times where I'm really trying to discover deep within myself, conquering challenges, I always go to your work. So it's such a pleasure to be interviewing you here today on the Hidden Series, the Hidden thank Trauma you. Series. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. So let's just share a little bit about your work because again, your work is incredible. You have an abundant amount of resources out there for both men and women. So let's have you share. Well, inner bonding is a very, very powerful uh, six-step self-healing process that it's a roadmap that enables people to um, understand the ways they're rejecting and abandoning themselves and what it really means to connect with themselves and learn to love themselves, value themselves, to find their own worth, and also to connect with a higher source of spiritual guidance, whatever that is for a person, whether it's inner, inner wise self, whether it's God, whatever it is, um, we, we need to be able to access a source beyond our program limited mind mm -hmm. for the wisdom of what it means to be loving with ourselves and others. So that's what this process is all about. Awesome, because I know sometimes when I'm feeling stuck or just not quite right, there could be these deep abandonment wounds inside. And I find that for me and my clients, it can be super limiting. And then it makes you feel stuck. You can't quite move forward. Right. Yeah, so people get stuck all the time. And um, so often, <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of trained in our society to look outside of ourselves. And so we get stuck and we think, oh, it's this, it's my partner or it's my work situation or it's my family. And we look outside of ourselves for what's keeping us stuck instead of how we're abandoning ourselves. Most people don't realize um, that there's actually four major ways that we reject and abandon ourselves. So I'd like to go through these. If oh, that's please. Okay. Yes, this is great. I love solutions too. <laughs> okay, so so one of the things that most of us have learned to do as we were growing up is stay focused in our mind. Because when we were very little, um, we couldn't handle big pain. Our bodies were too little, unless we had parents who were very loving instead of who were you know, in some way rejecting or abandoning us. Um, we had no way of managing pain. So we learned to disconnect from our bodies and stay up in our mind. Yes. But our feelings are in our body. And if you imagine your feelings as an inner child who communicates through feelings, if you're up in your mind and a child, for example, a real child comes to you and, and 
and is crying and you're just up in your mind working on your computer, um, maybe meditating or whatever, and you're not paying any attention to that child, that child's going to feel rejected and abandoned by you. Oh, wow. Same thing happens on the inner level. And so one of the things that we need to learn to do is move our focus from our mind into our body. Mm -hmm. um, we, were, we were born being in our body, feeling our feelings, being aware of them, but then we learn to dissociate, to disconnect from them. Now the challenge is to get back in our body because our feelings have vital information for us. I mean, it's so sad that people want to get rid of their feelings or numb their feelings. All of our feelings have very, very important information for us. Our, our feelings like anxiety and depression and guilt and shame and anger and aloneness and emptiness and jealousy indicate some form of self-abandonment, physical or emotional. And our feelings that come from life, like, like grief, heartache, heartbreak, helplessness over others, loneliness, these are letting us know about something that's happening in our environment, in a situation, or with another person. We need that's these important. feelings. That yeah. is so important. So it's taking a spin on it as well. This is telling me something. Right. And if I could just go in and experience it, feel it, my body is an antenna. It's telling me what I need to do. Yes. And, and see, that's the first step of inner bonding, is being willing to go in and get present with our feelings. Then the second step is open to learning. In inner bonding, um, you're either, either your intention is to protect against your pain with some form of addictive or controlling behavior, or your intention is to learn about what's loving to you, about your false beliefs, about how you're treating yourself, um, uh, you know, about, about what loving action you have to take. So, so we have to not only feel our feelings, but we have to want to learn from them. Mm -hmm. It's not enough just to feel them. We've got to be willing to learn what they're telling us, especially about how we're treating ourselves. So that first form of self-abandonment is staying in your mind rather than your body. Okay. The second form that so many of us have learned is to judge ourselves. I, I have not met anybody who didn't learn to tell themselves things like, I'm not good enough, or I'm unworthy, or there's something wrong with me, things like that. We all learn that as we were growing up wow. and we have false beliefs around that. We think that judging ourselves is going to motivate us to do better, do it right. If we do it right, then we'll get approval and then we'll be okay. But if you really look at it, you're going to find that self judgment actually immobilizes you, makes mm. you feel so bad and so stuck. Um, and people who I work with who do really well, you know, who are very successful and they say, well, I'm afraid to let go of judgment because I'm afraid I just won't do anything. They don't realize that they've done well in spite of the judgment, not because of it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so what people need to learn to do is to be compassionate with themselves. If, if you're judging yourself and you're judging your feelings, you can't learn, you're just gonna feel bad. Like, you know, again, a child comes to you upset and you say to the child, oh, what's wrong now? You know, the child feels judged, the child feels unloved, the child is not going to tell you what's wrong. Whereas if you're compassionate, you know, honey, what's going on? I'm here for you. That's what we have to do with ourselves as well. Oh, wow. So the third form of self-abandonment is that we turn to various substances and activities to numb out our feelings, whether it's food or drugs or alcohol or work or, or television or pornography or whatever, or yelling at somebody, mm -hmm. you know, making other people responsible. And that's the fourth one, making other people responsible for our feelings. So, so we, we, we numb out with various substances and activities and we make other people responsible for our feelings. All of this makes us feel alone mm -hmm. and rejected and anxious and depressed inside. And so it's so important to learn to be aware of how we're treating ourselves because th this is the major problem. And if you're in a relationship with somebody who's treating you badly, like you're in a relationship with a narcissist, um, how are you treating yourself? What are you allowing? Why are you staying in a relationship with somebody who's treating you badly? You might want to look at the fact 
that that person is mirroring how you're treating yourself. And just leaving a relationship without understanding how you're treating yourself, you're gonna take all that with you and you're gonna create the same relationship, even though it may look completely different. At the beginning, I mean, I've been doing this for so long that I see people go through three, four relationships. They think this one, oh, this is it. This is, you know, this is my Prince Charming. Um, this is my soulmate. And, you know, within a year or so, they're right back to the kind of relationship they had before. So we take ourselves with us. All relationships are a system and we need to deal with our, our end of the system, which is so often self abandonment. And then the other form of self abandonment is feeding yourself junk food. Uh -huh. You know, um, people don't realize um, what a huge effect eating processed foods and sugar and factory farm foods has on their feelings. It, it numbs you out, dumbs you down. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and you're not going to have the motivation or the energy to take care of yourself when you've been eating that um, processed food and junk food. So I just have a rule of thumb. If your great grandmother didn't eat it, which That's she good. didn't because they didn't have stores and they didn't have refrigerators. So they may, you know, they can, they fermented they grew their own food. It was natural food. It wasn't contaminated. So if your grandmother didn't eat it, don't eat it. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. And so for me, I've been eating organic food for the last 58 years. You look amazing, Margaret. I got to tell you, I just, I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. And I just told you, I just turned 80 years old. So I'm, you know, I, I'm very healthy uh, with high energy. And that's because of two major things. One, I only put clean, fresh, organic food into my body. I have not used processed foods for the last 58 years. And I practice inner bonding, which means I'm, I'm taking loving care of myself instead of abandoning myself on the emotional level. And those are the two things that are necessary for people to, to have what I call a high frequency, which is necessary for people to access that that inner wise self or higher wise self that lets you know what's best for you, what's in your highest good. Wow, you know, and when I, I will be honest here, I, as a busy professional, I do paleo, I eat organic when I can, but I was going out to eat a lot. I would just go pick it up and take it. And, I, and it's so common now, there's a store on every corner, several stores, people, it doesn't, it feels like they're not really eating out or they're not eating at home and cooking the meals. So I found a meal service that was created by a woman who had stage four cancer. She healed herself. They delivered the meals to me. At first, I was really disappointed because my taste buds were so used to the MSG, the extra spices, the extra sugar, the poor oils that are in these foods. Yeah. And I was so surprised. But now that I've been on this strict meal, I've lost weight. I feel more vibrant. I have raised my energy. And I knew better, but I thought, oh, if I could just go get this paleo type meal out, it will be okay. And I have seen such a difference in my own world just making those changes. So you're absolutely yeah. right. But, but you know, a lot of people can't afford to do that. Right. And they say, well, the organic food is too expensive, but it's really not. I mean, I make all of my own food and I'm a very busy person. So I've learned to do it in very simple ways, but you can get organic food. People can go to Costco. They can go to like um, King Super here in Colorado. They have tons of organic foods. And um, the, you know, it's much more expensive to be sick and to have to take drugs. I mean, here at 80, I do not have any of the diseases that people my age have. I have no arthritis, I've got no joint problems, I've got no heart problems, I mean, I don't have any autoimmune diseases. I don't have any of that, I'm, I'm extremely active. And so for me, I'm highly productive. I think that's really important Absolutely. to continue. I mean, I love my work, so I have no desire to, to, to retire, and so, you know, I'm going to continue to earn, which of course helps people to be able to do the things they want to do and to eat well. So I don't take that as an excuse. I've worked with many young people who have no money at all, mm -hmm. who found ways 
to eat really well, really healthy. So, um, you know, lots of people can't afford to have meals brought in. And I'm, I'm so glad you can, and I'm so glad you do. Um, but really, I sacrifice other areas. Like I'm not a person who goes out shopping, you know, because back in the day when I was working with people, you know, 90, hundred years old, I see how we treat our bodies when we're younger sure shows up when we're older. I really That's saw right. it. So That's I right. just sacrifice now with my meals when I'm busy creating this interview series, you know, instead of taking the time to cook, I just found a wonderful service, but I cut out, I don't travel, I don't go shopping, but it is a priority. But I, it's really important for my own physical and emotional pain. Well, yeah. And the other thing is, is that most people eat way too much. And if they just cut their, you know, what they eat in half, they'd have plenty of money to buy the really good food. Mm -hmm. People don't realize how little we need to eat in order to be truly nourished. If you're eating really nutrient dense food, you don't need a lot of food exactly. and you want to get really nourished. Right. And it goes into with that self-love, that self-compassion to really plan your day, plan your schedule. But I know oftentimes, because I work with a lot of people who have dysregulated nervous systems, and it really does go back to that inner self, right? That right. self-compassion and, and pausing and being self-reflective instead of being up here. Right. So do you have well, any advice for those emotional storms, those, those chaotic moments when it's overwhelming and people may shut down, may go to the alcohol. Yeah, see, but, but what, what we teach people is to develop what we call the loving adult. And the loving adult is who we are when we're open to learning about what is loving and what our false beliefs are that are creating that overwhelm. Okay. And we're connected with a higher source. This is so important. You know, I worked as a traditional psychotherapist for 17 years and I just was not happy with the results. And I had had tons of my own therapy and nobody really helped me with my overwhelm, my anxiety, my depression. So I, I knew that traditional psychotherapy um, just doesn't work well much of the time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to pray for something that would really work deep that people could do with themselves. And that's when my guidance brought in uh, the six steps of inner bonding. And so when people practice these six steps, it's like the workout for developing the loving adult. And in that state, the, the, you know, it's like a child who's dysregulated, but there's an adult there to pick them up, to hold them, to help them through it. That's what we need to be able to do for ourselves is to be that spiritually connected, loving adult self. Because when we're connected, to that higher guidance. We have so much strength. You know, we, we can easily regulate ourselves when we can bring in that love and that comfort and that wisdom. The problem is if you're um, just abandoning yourself emotionally and physically, you're not gonna be able to connect to that source. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very sad because that, to me, that's like living blind. That's how I lived for so long in that disconnected state. And it's a miserable state to live in. But when you learn to connect and what I call at will divine connection, which I teach people to do in, in my book, Diet for Divine Connection, teach people how to have that at will connection. And for people who wanna learn the inner bonding process, my recent workbook, the inner bonding workbook, will bring you through that whole process so that you know exactly what to do so that when you're dysregulated, you, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to go down the rabbit hole. You can learn to show up as that powerful, strong, wise, connected, loving adult self. Oh, wonderful. Could you share a little bit about your story? I know that you were in a 30-year marriage. Right. What happened? Something didn't work. Well, you know, I, I, first of all, I came from a dysfunctional family. Okay. Um, my mother was a narcissist. My father was a good father until I was 12. And then he tried to sexually abuse me and I had to stay away from him. And so I was an only child and I was pretty much alone and started in therapy. Um, and then I got married when I was 24. And, but I was not equipped. And so I had been trained to be a caretaker. I was a very empathic child and I could tune into everybody's feelings. And I was taught my feelings didn't count. And so I learned to take care of my parents, take care of my grandmother. And then of course, when I got married, 
I became the caretaker, which so many women are trained to do. Common. And my husband was the, the taker. And so I would do anything to avoid his anger, his disapproval, um, and his disconnection. He would get mad, he would withdraw, he would disconnect. And that was terrifying to me because I didn't know how to connect to myself. Well, then when inner bonding came in and I started to practice that and learn to connect to myself, I was no longer willing to play that role of caretaker. Now, with many of the people I work with, when they move out of, out of the taker or the caretaker position, the relationship gets much better. Unfortunately for me, it got much worse. Mm. My husband was very angry at my taking care of myself. He did not support me in learning to love myself. And so um, at some point, I moved into a different part of the house and I said, look, until you can actually be loving to me for you know, a few months instead of a few minutes, um, I'm not gonna be involved with you. I gave him two years to, to step up to the plate and he didn't. So th there was nothing else I could do because th th there was no way that I was gonna stay in a relationship with somebody who wasn't gonna support me in the thing that was most important to me, which is being whole. And, and, and I was really sick before then, really. I how you were feeling, because I could just imagine just like tension in your body. Oh, there was so much tension. Clenching. Uh, yeah, and even though I'd been eating really well all that time, because I'd been abandoning myself and living at the end of that criticism and anger, I, I had gotten really ill. And I knew, I knew when I started to practice inner bonding that if I didn't take care of myself, I was going to die. I was having a dialogue one day with my inner child where she started screaming at me and saying, you're taking care of everybody else. What about me? You know, when is it my turn? When do I get to count? You don't even know I'm here. And, and I heard this inner screaming going on. And I said, okay. And she said to me, how sick do I have to make you before you pay attention to me? That's, that's listening. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so that, <laughs> I want to hear a little went. bit about what you did because there might be some people here who they're hearing this and they're they they just they're ready. They know that they need to leave. What did you do to prep yourself to go after that many years? I'd imagine it was well. The, I mean that that was what happened when I practiced inner bonding because as I practiced and learned to connect with my guidance and learned to take care of myself, um, that was the preparation. I knew that I would be okay. Up until that point, um, I couldn't handle being hurt. I couldn't handle being alone. I was terrified of it. But as I learned to take care of myself and love and value myself and define my own inner worth instead of leaving that up to him or everybody else, I was very prepared to not be in, a, in any relationship with somebody who wasn't treating me with love. And so, yeah, by the time um, the marriage ended, I was in a very strong place. I, I, I had done my inner work. Mm -hmm. I didn't wait. I didn't wait until the marriage was over. And I wasn't blaming him and I wasn't angry with him. I just knew I, I needed to be with people who supported me in, in loving myself. And we all, we all need that. Yes. And that led to my extraordinary health. Once I left that, wow, it was like night and day with my health. And so it took you about two years from, from really making that decision. You were doing the inner work before you made the decision to leave. Yes, before I made the decision. And there were two life-affirming decisions that I made at that time. And one of them was that I was willing to lose everybody else, but I was no longer willing to lose me. Because I knew if I continued to lose me, I was going to die. And the second was that I was willing to be hurt. Up until that point, I was not willing to be hurt. And if you're not willing to be hurt, you are going to protect yourself by staying in your head, judging yourself, turning to, addi turning to addictions, if you're not willing to be hurt. Willingness, the willingness to be hurt is an incredibly powerful decision to make. And the reason I could make it, and it took me time, before I was able to make that, 
was because I had been practicing inner bonding, developing my loving adult, and I knew that I could handle it. I knew how to not take it personally. I knew how to not think it was all my fault, which I used to think before that. I knew that I could be in compassion for my own feelings. And so those two decisions, the willingness to lose everybody, but not lose me, and the willingness to be hurt, boy, that's, that's strength, that's freedom. People don't realize how much freedom that offers them when they make decisions like that. Yes, I think of freedom as expansion, openness, possibilities. You can dream again, be creative again, instead right. of being stuck in this really hurt place. Uh, would you please share more about the inner bonding? It sounds really great. I'd love to share this with the audience, how they can do some inner work on themselves. I know you have great resources also on your website. Right, right. Yeah. So step one, as I said, is being willing to tune into your body and feel your feelings and want responsibility for them. And step two is moving into your heart and consciously opening to learning about loving yourself and learning to connect with your higher source, which we teach people how to do, but it's about frequency. When they're open to learning and they're eating well, it's actually easy to connect. And then step three is a dialogue process. Um, just like you would talk to a child, like, honey, why are you so upset? Is there something I'm doing? Uh, we do that on the inner level. Is there something I'm doing? Is there something I'm telling you? Some way I'm treating you that's causing you to feel anxious or depressed or angry or whatever? Or is there something going on with somebody or a situation that I need to pay attention to? So we're dialoguing. Our, our inner child is our feeling self. So we're dialoguing with our feelings, which are in our body. And once we understand what we're doing, we go a little deeper to the wounded part of ourselves that's actually in the lower part of the brain called the amygdala. And this is where all of our false beliefs are. And so let's say that you discover that you're judging yourself and that's making you feel anxious or depressed. Then you would ask that, that wounded part of you, that ego part of you, why are you judging? When did you learn to do this? What do you hope for by judging? And so we become aware of a lot of false beliefs by going into that, that that's actually in the lower part of our mind. So we're, that's where all these beliefs are stored. And so we're opening to that sort of subconscious place. When we ask that kind of question, it opens us to understand more about the false beliefs that we're operating from. Once we understand that, then step four is we open to learning with our higher guidance. And we're asking, what is the truth? about any of the beliefs and what is loving to me. And that's one of the most important things that you can ask throughout the day. What is loving to me now? I ask it all day long. What is loving to me now? What is in my highest good now? And to understand that whatever is loving to you is also loving to everybody else because it's never loving to ourselves to be mean to others, to discount others, to not care about the effect our behavior has on others. That wouldn't be loving to ourselves. And so when we're really taking loving care of ourselves, we're also giving others the opportunity to take care of themselves mm -hmm. if they're going to do that. And then step five is taking that action. Whatever we've learned in step four, we have to take the action. And step six is we evaluate. How do I feel now as a result? Like if I was anxious, I go back in. And if I've taken a loving action for myself, how am I feeling? Am I still anxious? Or do I feel some relief? If I feel relief, then we know we've taken a loving action. It really does go back into getting out of the head, pausing, and going into the body. Right. I always and say it's like an antenna. It's learn. going to let you know. Right. Yeah, with, with that intention to learn. Intention is so important. Mm -hmm. We have to make that very conscious because our automatic default setting is the intention to protect against pain, to control our feelings, to control other people, to avoid our pain. That's the automatic default setting that we've all grown up with. And so we have to consciously decide that we wanna learn from our feelings, especially from our pain, rather than avoid it. Mm -hmm. 
And I often see, that's why this series is talking about those hidden traumas. It could be hidden traumas from your childhood, hidden traumas from losing a parent, for being in a 25-year marriage that didn't serve you, from a death in the family, losing someone you love, losing a career. Uh, can you speak to that? Because again, it is about getting in touch with your insights and your belief mm -hmm. systems. But to give some strategies, just awareness of, hey, you know, your everybody tells a story. What's your story? What are your beliefs and how to overcome that? Yeah. You know, it so, sounds like the inner bonding would be an amazing way to do that. Yes, it is. So I deal with very, very traumatized people. I mean, I deal with people who have had severe, very, very severe childhood abuse. Um, the most severe that you can imagine. People have been in wars. I mean, I deal with people who have been deeply traumatized. And, and you know, what research has found, like it, if there's a traumatized child, the thing that helps the most is the child being held with compassion. That is what is most healing. So we need to learn to do that for ourselves. Not that we can't ask for help, not that we can't get nurturing and holding from others, but we also have to learn to do this for ourselves, to take care of ourselves, to bring love to ourselves, to bring compassion to ourselves, rather than continue to abandon ourselves. Because every time we abandon ourselves, we are re-traumatizing ourselves. Mm. And so to heal trauma, to heal PTSD, we have to learn to love and value ourselves. We have to learn to bring that wisdom and that comfort and that compassion into ourselves, as well as reach out to others, because deeply traumatized people cannot do it all by themselves. And, and this is where I work with people like in my five-day intensives, where I get many traumatized people. And I, and I um, uh, you know, I, I, in, in that setting, I, I, I hold them, I reparent them, and help them learn to reparent themselves. And you would be amazed at the healing that happens in such a short period of time. Mm, that's so beautiful. And speaking of, you know, triggers, because you could be having a, a decent day, there could be a memory gets pulled out, a trigger, and all of a sudden, your inner child is screaming. <laughs> you might say, right. I'm an adult, why is this happening? Where did this come from? <laughs> do, you see, right. do you have any words for that when that comes up? But first, it's really oh, being aware that maybe right. it's old coming up. Yeah. And so again, the first thing that you do is breathe into your body, use your breath to take you inside your body. Notice any physical sensations going on in your body because um, emotions generally show up as physical sensations. So breathe into it and get present, just breathing in and getting present with whatever is being triggered is going to help those feelings. Just being with yourself in that moment is going to help. And then really wanting to know, okay, there's gotta be a good reason. You see, instead of judging, judging is, oh my God, here I am, I'm triggered again, what's the matter with me? I thought I was past this, why does this keep happening? I mean, that, that's the judgment. But if we accept that healing takes time and we're, we're compassionate and we know we have a very good reason for being triggered, that, that's what enables us to open to learning and be compassionate. And that's part of the intention to learn is to be able to say to yourself, you know, I must have a really good reason for having gotten triggered. There must be something that's, that, that, that's, that's scary to me. There must be a belief in here. There must be an experience that I need to attend to, maybe from the past. And so instead of judging, we want to know that, of course, we have good reasons. These are things that have happened to us. These are our fears. These are our false beliefs. We don't want to judge them. We want to move towards them with deep compassion. Mm. Beautiful. And I, I see a lot of people, myself included, I was in a full body brace in a wheelchair. People wanted to help me. And I, I wasn't open to that. I thought, I have to do this all on my own. I'm going to do it myself. And even with my clients, it's a hard time. I said, no, I'm really here to support you. I'm open to helping you. But just getting that courage to ask for help can be so hard for some people. Yeah, well, the problem is, I mean, that, that was hard for me. Because when, when I asked for help in my family, mm. the feeling that I got was that I was a burden. 
you know, oh, if somebody stuff. did help, it wasn't, oh, sure, honey, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't from love. It was, oh, God, I have to, you know, help her. Well, that's a terrible feeling. And then I had the same experience with my husband. It wasn't like he was happy to help me. It was that uh, he would do it sometimes out of obligation, but uh, most of the time he would go into resistance. He would say he would do it, but he wouldn't. And so it became very hard for me mm. to ask for help because I think one of the hardest feelings for us is when we really do need help, but the person that we ask for help actually doesn't care about that. Mm. that. That was one of the things that was hardest for me in finally learning to take care of myself is that I was so scared to find out that the people who said they loved me didn't. They didn't. They just loved how I loved them. And so uh, I, that's why I had to be willing to lose everybody because I was caretaking my husband, my parents, my kids, my clients. And when I finally started to take care of myself, it wasn't just my husband who was upset. It was my kids, my parents. I mean, everybody was upset with me because I was Mother Earth. I mean, I was doing a great job of taking care of everybody else while abandoning myself. So it, it, I was so used to not asking for help. I was so used to doing everything myself and uh, being there to help everybody else. So it's taken, it's taken a process for me to be willing to say, I, I need some help here mm -hmm. and to ask for help. And if somebody doesn't want to give it out of love, then I speak up for myself now. Mm -hmm. I, I say something. I say, you know, there must be a good reason that you're not um, happy to help me right now. I'd like to understand what's going on rather than just not ask. And another thing I see is people, particularly I see this a lot with my female clients, women, is they give to everybody else. They're always giving and saying yes and last to themselves. Mm -hmm. So then they crash and right. have a hard time believing they can actually say no to protect themselves. Do you have any advice for well, well, yes. people? Uh, you know, that, that's exactly the situation I was in. I um, never said no to anybody. I, I said yes to every single thing until I crashed, until I got sick. And so um, there has to be a change of intention because saying yes and caretaking others, taking care of others is actually a form of control. And I didn't realize that for a long time. I thought control was somebody getting angry, somebody getting critical, somebody withdrawing. I didn't realize that compliance of being a good girl, saying yes to everything was also a form of control to avoid somebody's upset with me. You see, it's a form of, of controlling how people feel about us. And when I realized that, I said, oh, you know, I'm just as controlling as the, the, this is just a covert form of control, just like anger is an overt form. This is a covert form of control. Wow. And I realized I wasn't giving purely out of love. I had an agenda. And that is that they would love me because I was abandoning myself. And so when I realized that, I didn't want to be controlling. And, and that's when I realized I, I'm going to learn to take care of myself instead of try and get love and approval from others. And, and, and the other thing I realized is that so many people go into a relationship um, from that self-abandoned place. And so they're always trying to get love and they might try and get love with that covert form of control, being good, being nice, saying yes to everything. That's completely different than what happens when you're loving yourself filling yourself up with love and then you have love to share see when when you're abandoning yourself you don't have love to share you're coming from an empty space inside and so you're always trying to get love and there's such a difference in how we feel from getting love even if we get it for brief periods of time then there isn't sharing love sharing love is truly the highest experience of life it, it it's just so glorious to be with somebody when I'm full of love to share and they're full of love to share and we get to share that love and nobody's trying to control anybody either with any anger or any compliance. It's just, we're taking care of ourselves and we're sharing that love. And that's what a loving relationship is all about. Oh, sounds beautiful. Would you mind painting a picture of self-care? I know you're great at it. Uh, just sharing what that would look like for someone and how they can start getting more healthy more self-care in their life, obviously the foods they're eating, um, making space for themselves when it's been so crowded, giving and controlling 
to help others. Yeah. So really it's about learning to listen to themselves. That is the most important aspect of self-care is learning to listen inside to what do you want? Like somebody asks you to go out uh, for dinner and you go inside and you say, do I want to go out for dinner? Do I want to spend time with this person? Or do I want to spend time with myself? Do I want to get in bed and read a book? Or do I want to go work out? What do I want? See, it, it's, not like there's, um, it's not like there's a template for self-care. It's whatever it is that's best for us in any given moment. And as we learn to listen to ourselves and listen to our higher guidance, then it becomes easy in any given moment to say, what do I really want and what is in my highest good? So it's listening and it's being open to learning about what's best for us. And at this point, I have no trouble saying no. I don't go out to eat anymore because there's so few restaurants that, you know, that have good food. So if somebody says, you know, let's go out. I say, no, but you're welcome. I'll, you know, come over here and I'll make dinner for us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not going to give myself up. I'm not going to do it just because somebody else wants me to, because it's not in my highest good. Yeah, so much is just pausing from the busy, from all the cell phone notifications and social media and just pausing. And I know with people, because I do somatic experiencing, they tend to dissociate. So I know for myself back in the day, it was really hard for me to dip in. I'd dip in and then I'd be out again. Right. And that dissociation piece can be, can be part of it to heal that first as well, to get longer periods where you could actually dive in and pay attention. Yeah, yeah so... What, what I recommend is that people practice step one of inner body. It took me a long time to okay. move from my head to my heart and soul. That, that's maybe the biggest journey any of us will ever take is moving our focus from our head to our heart and soul. So um, that's what I recommend people practice is, is becoming aware of where is your focus? Is it in your head or is it in your body? And mm. what I needed to do is I wore this little gadget called a motivator that buzzed against my body and you could, oh, cool. I could, I could program it to buzz every five minutes and then every 10 minutes and then every half an hour. I and so that's that. how I did it. Yeah. So that's how I trained myself to get out of my head and into my body. And I put sticky notes around to say, tune in, tune in. And I wore a rubber band to re I mean, I did all sorts of things to remind me because I couldn't remember, you know, when, when, when you're so programmed to be in your head, it's hard to remember to be in your body with your feelings. I mean, I, I was just so used to ignoring my feelings. I had no idea what I felt about anything. So it took practice. And that's what I recommend people do is practice step one of inner body, being present in your body with your feelings. That changes everything. And, and, and I call it having your inner baby monitor on. Like if you have a baby and you want to be a good parent, you don't just put the baby in the crib and go out to lunch. You've got a baby monitor on. And the minute the baby goes, eh, you, you're in there. You know, what does the baby need? It need to be fed, need a diaper change, need to be held. And so that's what we want to do, have our inner baby monitor on so that we can attend to ourselves when we're feeling anything less than peace inside. Mm. Absolutely. In my experience with that, as I was learning the somatic work, it's, I really, if someone said to me, Bring your awareness to your heart. Feel deep in your heart. I couldn't do it at yeah. first. It was kind of empty. So I've had yeah. to train myself. So I love the suggestions that you've given. That's really important. And so we've talked about people pleasing. What about perfectionism? What do you see with patterns of why we become perfectionistic and hard overworking people pleasing? Well, see, that's also coming from a major false belief ah. that if I do everything perfect and I do everything right, then I can have control over how people feel about me. And that's coming from another false belief. And that is that my self-worth is determined by how other people feel about me. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was most life-changing for me is when I realized that I could define my own worth through my higher guidance that I could learn to see who I am through the eyes of love 
rather than handing that responsibility to somebody else. That, that's like, you know, again, if you have a child and instead of seeing that child and valuing that child, you keep saying to the child, well, that person has to like you for you to be okay, or that person has to value you and you better do everything right. You got to be perfect. You know, let's say the child is going to a party and you say, now you got to act perfect and you got to say the right thing so that those people like you or you're not okay. Well, of course, that's going to create a tremendous amount of stress. And yet that's what so many people are telling themselves. I got to be perfect. I got to do it right so that these people will value me and then I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But of course, even if they do value you, then what about the next one? And then, you know, what about the next one and the next person, the next person? It, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. When you learn to value who you are intrinsically in your heart and soul, not by your looks, not by your performance, but by who you really are. That's when perfectionism, I mean, I used to be such a perfectionist and I don't, I don't have that anymore because I know who I am in my heart and soul and I value that. And so, I, I mean, I, I let my little girl know, hey, you're, fa you're fantastic, I love you, I'm here for you, I'm gonna take care of you. you I mean, there's uh, no such thing as perfect anyway. And anyway, we can't control how people feel about us, so why bother? It just takes up too much energy. Hmm. But perfectionism is coming from that major false belief of being able to control how people feel and that they define your worth. Wow, and that just comes from life, from our experiences and what our interpretations is of it. And I think so much there is for many people, I know myself included, it peaks its ugly head sometimes, is that I'm not good enough. Right. I'm not good enough. That little, it's so subconscious and it could run through and the, the act of self-sabotage, which again is, oh, I'm not really aware. You know, these are interesting right. concepts that, you know, bringing forth to people watching that they can start tuning into how their operating system is running. Yeah. And, and see, virtually all of us made that decision at some point, because when we were very little and we weren't getting the love we needed, even if our parents were were you know loving and, and wanted to be loving we all have experiences of, of not getting what we need either with parents or siblings or school or whatever of, of not be, you know being loved of, of not being seen and valued for who we are and so we only have one of two ways of seeing that let's say that that your parents didn't see you and value you and were rejecting in various ways either you were so brilliant that you said, okay, my, I've, I'm born in this family with parents who don't know how to love, but I've never met anybody who really understood that. And so the only other decision we can make is that I'm not being loved because it's my fault. And it's my fault because I'm not good enough. And if only I figure out how to be good enough, then I can have control over getting the love I need and avoiding the pain I can't handle. And so that is the core false belief of our ego wounded self. I'm not good enough. And what that does for us as, as little kids is that it gives us a sense of control because if it's my fault that I'm not being loved because I'm not good enough, then I can kind of hide away who I really am, my beautiful soul. And I can figure out how to act and be so that people think I'm good enough. You see, so that gives me a sense of control over it's like getting wearing a mask. Pardon? <laughs> it's like wearing a mask. Yeah, it is wearing a mask. That's the mask we create to try and get love and avoid pain and feel safe. And so now if we go on, on a healing journey, we got to take that mask off. We got to discover that, that beautiful, incredible, wonderful, gifted essence that we all have that we hid away at some point because we weren't being loved. And we have to learn to love and value who we truly are. Mm, absolutely. And it's an unraveling. It's an unfolding. Right. It isn't just instant. It does take work. And the inner bonding sounds like it's a great process. And we've definitely shed some light of just inner awarenesses. Simple right. little things. Just turning yourself from out of here going into your body. Right. Right. And for that spiritual piece, that spirituality piece, can you speak of that? Because I love the title of your free ebook. It is, uh, Dear God, How Can I Heal So That I May Love? Because we don't have to do this all on our own. Right. We don't. 
and that and we live in a universe of wisdom of love of of um of peace of joy this is what this is what we live in i mean this is what quantum physics has proven that we we know this is not empty space here that that our soul is very big it's it's all around us it's connected to the wisdom of the universe and so we can access that when our frequency is high enough when we're open to learning and we're eating clean organic food so that the frequency of our body is high enough so the intention to learn about loving ourselves raises the frequency of our mind high enough and good food raises the frequency of our body high enough and that allows us to have that at will divine connection and that is so amazing i mean you people don't believe how amazing it is to start to live that way where you know you're not alone when people first start doing this they think they're making up the information i said that's okay just you know it's okay if you think you're making it up but listen to it and follow it and see what happens mm -hmm. cuz I was brought up in an atheist family. I was not brought up with anything spiritual. In fact, my wow. father used to say, um, anybody who believes in God is just using it as a crutch. So I had to figure it out myself. And it was so mind blowing to me when I started to have that at will access, which everybody can have when they learn to raise their frequency. Beautiful. And you've spoken a lot about intention today. And I am guided through intention. If I need to, um, like recently I had to, I had to get a new car and I had, I set an intention that I am going to find the just right car today. And I had this drive. It was just a knowing it was me kind of willing it to happen. I didn't have doubt and I, I made it happen and something even better than I planned came out. Uh, when I work with clients and my hands are on them doing the manual therapies, I'm working with intention. My mind is on their bodies connecting and almost mentally willing it to change. And I want people to get this because you've brought it up a couple of times about how important intention is because magic could happen. I've seen it. Right. That's right. See, when, when, when you set the intention to get the car you really wanted, that was an intention to be loving to yourself. Oh, high vibration. Yeah. Yeah. And so because you really wanted to be loving to yourself, you could set that intention with spirit to find the car you wanted. And that's what happens is that when our intention is to love ourselves, our frequency goes up and we get all kinds of spiritual help. It's just, it's mind boggling what happens when we can co-create with spirit, which is what you did about the car because you had the intention to be loving to yourself. Yeah, and another thing I've been doing lately is just trusting when something out of left field happens. Like recently I couldn't, uh, the rental car, I need a rental car, and there were none available in the city I was going to. So I'm at the airport, I'm at the gate, and who is there but a friend of mine who just happened to have a rental car and who could help me out. And it was just, Interesting. It was an ex-boyfriend, actually. So it was a little awkward. And I just looked up and laughed and said, okay, Divine, what are you showing me here today? I'm just going to trust this. I'm just going to ride the waves. And instead of like, oh, I have to deal with him. And, you know, it was just beautiful. But I did say to myself, I'm going to rephrase this and I'm going to trust. And be, and be grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gra gratitude is a great way to raise our frequency. When we go into genuine gratitude for what spirit is bringing us, something like that, whether it's the car or the ex-boyfriend, um, and, and, and we feel gratitude in our heart for the help that we're getting, um, mm -hmm. that's, that always raises the frequency. So I always encourage people to look for anything you can be grateful for throughout the day. You know, whether it's the food that you eat, whether it's where you live, even things like you have your hands, you have your feet, you have your eyes, your ears. Not everybody has that. Yeah. And so just being grateful for the everyday things and then for the wonderful things that happen. That's a wonderful way to keep your frequency high. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. And I have a curious question. Uh, you created the self quest. Could you share what that is? Yeah, so SelfQuest is a, is a program I've worked on for over 20 years. It's an amazing online program, and people can um, join the, the online um, program.
program for three months, six months, or uh, unlimited access by going to selfquest.com. Um, and they, um, it's a, it's an online program that teaches inner bonding in a very, very in-depth way. Brings you through your history, your belief systems, brings you through inner bonding and conflict with somebody else or with yourself, takes you deeper into relationships, parenting, spirituality, dream work. Uh, it teaches the emotional freedom technique, the tapping. There's so many um, uh, things in, in SelfQuest. It's, it's a very big program. And if people spend maybe 10, 15 minutes a day, it'll take them a, uh, like three or four months to go through it, but they can go back to it over and over again to get taken through the inner bonding process. Oh, that's great. And I just got to tell you from a personal experience, your work is wonderful. I remember having really challenging times and I'd have you in my ear when I was walking my dog and I shifted every time I listened to you. So that's I'm really great. grateful to have you on and share this wonderful work with everybody who might be struggling as well. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share it, Phaedra. It was lovely to spend some time with you. Yes, Dr. Margaret Paul, everyone, be sure to look up her work, especially if you're hurting and really wanting to find that inner bond and inner strength. She's amazing. Wow, that was such a great interview. I loved how she gave just specifics on, hey, we've got to go in, get out of our minds, be in our bodies. And I tell you, that is exactly what I teach my clients to do. We need to do that. Without awareness, there is no choice. And we just run on autopilot. So be sure to sign up for Dr. Margaret Paul's free gift and find out more about her. It will help you during those challenging times. And if you're feeling like you want a little one-on-one -on -one support, you're loving the content in this interview series and really want to keep these interviews so you can listen to them over and over and reinforce these positive habits, I invite you to purchase the series. And it includes lots of bonuses and it also includes mapping trauma in your body where it'll take you on a discovery of your journey and looking at maybe some of those coping mechanisms that you've created in your life to help you survive. And if you're stuck and you're in emotional pain and physical pain, it also includes a 45 minute session with me and we can help you uncover some of those hidden traumas and give you some actionable steps to really break free. So thanks for watching. I'm your host Phaedra Antioco and stay tuned. We have so many amazing experts sharing their stories, sharing their triumphs and how they've overcome such diversity in their lives with the five D's.